Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning, Dr. Marino. Good morning. Namaskar. Namaskar. Good morning, Dr. Marino. Good morning. Namaskar. <laughs> Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, Rekha, ma'am. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Principal, ma'am. Hello, Nina. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody from the city beautiful Chandigarh, and a very good morning to our distinguished speaker for the day, Dr. Elisabetto Marino from the University of Rome. On behalf of the Postgraduate Department of English, Meherchand Mahajan DAV College for Women, Chandigarh, I extend a warm welcome to each one of you to this extension lecture on Mary Shelley and the beginning of science fiction. And it is my prerogative to share that we are undertaking this collaborative academic exercise in association with another reputed institution of the region, Gopichand Arya Mahila College, Abohar, Punjab. And we firmly believe that knowledge sharing is the core of all education. And this lecture will surely give an impetus to our young scholars to explore the avenues for research in the field of science fiction. We are glad to share that our participants, that both the institutions are managed by DAV College Managing Committee, New Delhi, which has made immense contribution to the field of education in India and abroad. Our warm greetings to honorable principals of both the institutions, Dr. Nisha Bhargava and Dr. Rekha Sooth, ma'am. May I now briefly introduce both the colleges to you, which are being steered by two dynamic academicians, as I mentioned. Established in 1968, Meherchand Mahajan Devi College for Women has a long prestigious legacy that has been built over the past 52 distinguished years. Awarded grade A by NAC and adjudged by National Institutional Ranking Framework among top 150 best colleges in the country this year, we have hosted the President of India, His Excellency Sri Ramnath Kovind himself, who graced the college to celebrate yeah. the Golden Jubilee of the Institute in 2018. The college was also awarded the first prize for the cleanest residential college oh, in the country yeah, yeah, yeah. in the yeah. National Swachh Campus Rankings 2018 by the Government of India. And the saga of excellence and commitment continues year after year as we continue to get the government grant for funding some of our most ambitious projects. Dr. Nisha Bhargava, our Honorable Principal Ma'am, has a major role to play in shaping the journey of excellence of our college. A notable academician, NAC assessor, researcher, member State Legal Services Authority Chandigarh, and Punjab University sitting oh, senator, mean, no, no, the since her I second term so in the Punjab University Senate. <laughs> Dr. Bhargava is a prolific author in the field of energy economics, and she has authored three books and co-authored one. Besides writing many papers, contributing to many journals in reputed national and international publications, she is a member of various decision-making bodies of Punjab University. Her commitment to the cause of environment has spearheaded many innovative projects in our institution. Similarly, Gopichand Arya Mahila College Abohar has a great legacy to carry forward. Established in 1972, it holistically provides a Gandhian envisioned education in the region. It is also run by DAV College's Managing Committee, New Delhi, and under the patronage of Seth Gopichand Ahuja, a leading businessman and philanthropist the college was founded in 1972. The institution is being spearheaded by Dr. Rekha Sood Handa, who is a versatile personality with many valuable outputs and outcomes at various levels during her 22 years of service as HOD, PG Department of History, and now the principal. She has a long list of research activities which she has carried forward in her distinguished academic journey. 
the institution is serving the cause under her stewardship, uh, the cause of women education, not only in Abohar city, but also in surrounding villages and towns of Punjab, Haryana, and Rajasthan. And since the inception, this institution has taken a tremendous leap in the academic, cultural, and sports fields and has carved an enviable niche for itself among the women colleges of the city. We are very, very beholden to you, ma'am, for being a part of this journey with us. And uh, we at MCM promise you on behalf of uh, um, my, my principal, ma'am, uh, that we are going to continue with this hand-holding exercise in years to come also. I would now request Madam Principal, Dr. Nisha Bhargava, to welcome our participants and our distinguished speaker for the day. Thank you, Nina. Thank you very much. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. okay, it's okay. Uh, dear Professor Elisabetta Marino, our eminent resource person for today, Dr. Rekha Sood Handa, Principal Gopi Chandarya Mahila College Abohar, Mrs. Nina Sharma, Head, Postgraduate Department of English at Meher Chand Mahajan DAV College for Women, Chandigarh. Dr. Aarti Kapoor, Head, Postgraduate Department of English from DAV College Abohar. Faculty members and dear participants, I welcome you all on this extension lecture on Mary Shelley and Birth of Science Fiction, which is to be delivered by our distinguished guest, Professor Marino. A world of opportunities lies before us as we take pride in human curiosity and persistence to explore the secrets of the universe. Immense advancements in the field of science and technology have transformed the world, but ironically, these developments have also proved to be the bane of the human race thanks to the overweening ambition of man to control nature and to subvert the power structures in the universe. We have witnessed the devastating nuclear explosions in the Second World War. A number of summits have been held to discuss the catastrophic climate changes which threaten to wipe out the entire human existence from the face of Earth. This subject has been discussed by the writers and more recently by the filmmakers who are gifted with fertile imagination. And rise of the science fiction in various mediums underlines this very relevant aspect of our materialistic world. And I'm so glad that the postgraduate department of English in association with Gopichand Arya Mahila College, Abohar, which is a prominent college in Punjab, has taken this initiative to deliberate upon the rise of science fiction so as to reaffirm that science must not be used as a weapon against humanity, which it was meant to serve. I would like to share with our guests that our postgraduate department of English runs honors course at undergraduate level and a functional English vocational course. It also runs master's program as well as MPhil and PhD programs in English. In fact, our English Research Center is the first research center in English affiliated to Punjab University. And I pray for the consistent growth of the department as well as our great institution, which was established in the memory of Justice Meher Chand Mahajan, the third Chief Justice of India and the Prime Minister of Kashmir under Maharaja Hari Singh. Once again, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished guest who has spared her valuable time for us. I extend a hearty welcome to the participants and to Rekha Ma'am, who is a very dear friend and also to faculty of both the colleges which are working and growing under DAV College Managing Committee 
which is the largest non-government organization in the world and is successfully running more than 1000 institutions across the country under the visionary leadership of our honorable president dr poonam suri ji who is a padma shri awardee i am sure that this collaborative effort by the two institutions will open up new opportunities of research and pedagogy during coming days and i express my deep appreciation for the efforts of mrs neena sharma head of department who has successfully conceived and executed this idea in a brilliant manner thank you very much thank you ma'am thank you ma'am may i now invite dr rekha sood handa to say a few words to our principal and then we shall move Shina. on to our distinguished speaker thank you dear dr neena am i audible to all of you yes yes ma'am yes yeah. A warm good afternoon, as well as greetings of the day to one and all present. I, Dr. Ekha Sudhanda, hereby join hands with Dr. Nisha Bhargava, worthy Vice Principal of MCM Chandigarh, while welcoming our keynote speaker or the main speaker of the day, Dr. Elizabetta Marino, Associate Professor of English Literature, University of Rome. she will focus on marishali and birth of science as described by dr disha bhargava i appreciate dr marino for giving her sunday me time to us okay. the whole organizing team members dr neena sharma head of the pg department of english mcm chandigarh dr arti kapoor head pg department of english gopichand arya mahila college abohar miss urvi sharma coordinator of the today's event faculty members of both colleges and precious students of both institutions are also being welcomed by me gopichand arya mahila college abohar is pleased to have opportunity to collaborate with mcm dav chandigarh to organize today's discourse i welcome the initiative of mcm dav chandigarh pg department of english and look forward for many more intellectual moves in future too i hope this extension lecture will strengthen the knowledge skills and enhance the international profile of the institution too as well as i think this will make the students and higher education authorities to understand the international perspective of the topic the participants belonging to higher education in, in, in english literature will be benefited with this particular extension lecture this these types of initiatives can help in connecting young minds to reduce disparity among institutions in terms of resources as they are being shared and help us to move towards inclusivity in education i am hopeful that this new innovative virtual forum of collaboration between the both institutions will be well received by the students and it will prove rich learning experience for them also many thanks to our worthy resource person dr elizabeth beta marino for her virtual presence among us and our students as well as faculty members thank you dr nisha bhargava for giving us the opportunity to be the part of your institution and it is a proud moment for us that abuho a border area is collaborating with the national institution as well as institute international university of rome thank you to both of the both the sweet ladies of this particular webinar <laughs> and Thank you, Thank you to all of you again, and I give it to Dr. Nina Sharma. Thank you, Dr. Nina. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thanks for your very uh, benign words. Uh, may I now request uh, my very dear young colleague, Ms. Urvi, to introduce our distinguished speaker who are participants. Urvi. Thank you, ma'am. Greetings to everyone. I feel honored and privileged to have the opportunity to introduce the esteemed resource person for today's event. Professor Elizabeth Marino is an associate professor 
of English literature and American literature at the University of Rome. She is the author of four monographs, including a volume on the figure of Tamilly in British and American literature, an introduction to British Bangladeshi literature, a study on the relationship between Mary Shelley and Italy, and analysis of romantic dramas on mythological subjects. She has also edited and co-edited 10 collections of essays and published extensively on English romantic writers, especially Mary Shelley and P.B. Shelley, Indian diasporic literature, travel literature, and Italian-American literature. I invite her now to enlighten and broaden our understanding of Mary Shelley and her contribution to the genre of science fiction. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this warm welcome. And I'm truly delighted and honored to be here with you today and with your students. So um, now, uh, normally we think of Frankenstein as uh, a novel connected with uh, um, the personal experiences of Mary Shelley. We all know of the Geneva uh, gathering with Lord Byron, um, Matthew Gregory Lewis, uh, uh, P.B. Shelley. We all know of the uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, literary challenge that Byron uh, sent out for them. But uh, there is a whole scientific background in Frankenstein that always have to be taken into consideration when you uh, grapple with this extremely complex and multifaceted volume published for the first time in 1818 and written by a very young lady who was very much aware of the scientific debate of the period. And today I will try to shed light on this scientific side of Frankenstein, also showing that uh, uh, Mary Shelley somehow anticipated some of the problems that we are facing nowadays by focusing the reader's attention on the limits and the problems, the ethical problems connected with the idea of science and progress. But first of all, uh, let's try to shed light on the period. Uh, when Mary Shelley was uh, writing Frankenstein, actually the scientific debate was very fertile. The very uh, term, the very word biology was invented at the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, scientific and literary groups uh, that were trying to enlighten the people, the readership, uh, by publishing, by uh, giving conferences. One of them, uh, one of these groups, was the so-called Lunar Society, which gathered together literary people and scientists. Uh, because in those days, uh, there was not such a clear-cut division between the humanistic uh, research and the scientific research. Uh, many literary people were also scientists. And Percy Shelley himself, uh, uh, there is a detail that is extremely interesting, Percy Shelley himself, uh, as a pastime, as a sport, we would say nowadays, uh, would go to uh, the dissection rooms in hospitals. Uh, uh, because uh, he considered uh, these sections and anatomy uh, operations um, very interesting phenomena for his own uh, literary side. And he also performed experiments with gunpowder and uh, his room uh, at Eton, for example, was full of scientific devices because he also experimented with science and involved, actively involved Mary Shelley in his experiments. 
Now let's go back to the Lunar Society. The Lunar Society gathered people such as uh, um, Erasmus Darwin, who was the great grandfather of Charles Darwin and the author of The Temple of Nature, a, a literary work that aimed at explaining scientific research under the guise of a literary text. And then there was Jason Priestley, who was also a scientist of the period. Benjamin Franklin himself participated in some of the gatherings of the Lunar Society. And uh, uh, the Shelleys and also William Godwin were also members of the Lunar Society. And in the Lunar Society, uh, which was called in this way because people met uh, when there was the full moon at night, because there was no electricity and uh, therefore they could move freely along the roads with uh, the moonlight. Um, during this, these gatherings, during these meetings of the Lunar Society, people discussed the most important scientific researches of the times and the disputes between different branches of science in those days. Between these disputes, one very important one was the one between the vitalists and the materialists. The vitalists uh, were uh, headed by Mr. Abernethy, who was uh, a prominent physician of the times. And uh, Mr. Abernethy and his followers believed that life was not just in the material side of life. So life was not just in the body was not just in the mechanical functioning of our body, but there was some um, external, supernal, godly, spiritual element infused into the body, which regulated the functioning of the body itself. On the other hand, uh, the opposing faction um, was led by William Lawrence. William Lawrence was also uh, Percy Shelley's personal physician. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the materialists believed that our body was just a mechanism and in order to uh, continue to assure life in this mechanism or to revive to life this mechanism one had simply to find the key so according to them there was a key element and once you discovered the key element you could immediately revive even corpses. And obviously, as uh, you may all be aware of, um, Victor Frankenstein in Mary Shelley's volume for sure was a materialist uh, physician, a materialist scientist, because he believed that by using electricity, all the bodies, all the dead bodies, all this assemblage of body parts both human and animal could be brought back to life. So no God was involved, no supernal element was involved, it was just a mechanism. Uh, in the Lunar Society and all the other um, uh, groups, uh, scientific and literary groups of the people, there were also other important scientific debates. The debate between evolutionists and creationists. The evolutionists simply uh, refrained from intervening into nature. They thought that the purpose of the scientist was just to record and take notes of natural phenomena and then observe them and draw rules out of them. 
On the other hand, the creationists believed that you could influence the development of nature. You could somehow manipulate the development of nature. And this element of manipulation of nature is very much present in Frankenstein, in the action of Victor Frankenstein, who actually intervenes, manipulates, distorts nature in order to pursue his own personal goals. Um, together with these uh, um, philosophical and scientific debates, uh, Mary Shelley was very much influenced by uh, the works of an Italian scientist, Luigi Galvani. Luigi Galvani discovered what uh, is mentioned several times by Mary Shelley in Frankenstein, that is the so-called Galvanism. He believed that inside animals, inside human and animal bodies, there was uh, uh, some kind of animal electricity. So, uh, together with our blood, electricity somehow circulated. And when the body died, just by adding from the outside electricity, you could revive the circulation of our internal electricity. And therefore, you could revive also a corpse. Luigi Galvani uh, tried this test uh, with frogs, uh, with the legs of the frogs. So uh, the frog was dead and by using electrodes and electricity, he noticed that the legs of the frogs kept on moving. But obviously, when you removed the electricity, the legs stopped. His ideas were brought to perfection by his nephew, Giovanni Aldini, who actually went to England to perform his experiments. Why did he go to England and why did he not remain in Italy? This could be a good question. In Italy, due to Catholicism, one could not perform any experiment on human bodies because the body was sacred, because according to Catholicism, uh, when there is uh, the, the, the final judgment and the soul resurrects, every soul will then look for its body and the body will resurrect uh, together with the soul. So you could simply not perform any kind of experiment with the human body. And therefore, Giovanni Aldini decided to go to England, where they could perform experiments on human bodies. And in actual fact, whoever died in the Newgate prison uh, was given to science. Um, his or her body was given to science to experiment with. Therefore, he went and uh, he used the body of uh, many people who were sentenced to death. He manipulated those bodies. He applied electricity. And uh, uh, there are records and records of these experiments which are extremely interesting. And according to what they wrote, the bodies revived. The leads moved. The limbs used to shake with electricity. And according to one of these reports, one of the bodies actually moved, stood up and walked. So um, the news of these experiments spread, obviously, through the papers which Mary Shelley read. And therefore, she was very much uh, uh, intrigued by the possibility of reviving these corpses. And this is uh, the ground, um, the stepping stones, the bricks through which she decided to uh, build her novel. Um, 
obviously, uh, Mary Shelley's novel uh, is not just a novel concerned with science. But in harmony with what I told you so far, she decided to join the scientific side with the more humane and ethical side. And therefore, she used the element of science to ponder and reflect on the limit of science, on the ethical problems that science could pose to humankind. If you have read the novel, um, you for sure will have noticed that uh, uh, Victor Frankenstein is not just a scientist who is performing an experiment. He is first of all a father to his creature and a bad father, a neglecting father, a father who neglects his creature to such an extent that the abandoned creature without the possibility of being educated by his father then becomes a monster. And Mary Shelley uh, really lingers on this factor. She really delves into the problems of education, uh, not just the problem of science. Uh, even though uh, the creature is uh, uh, a laboratory product, because, uh, as we mentioned before, he was composed by stitching together human parts, body parts, and uh, uh, all revived by infusing electricity into this massive assemblage of uh, spare parts. This creature is uh, actually a child. And as a child, uh, According also to the uh, theories of education of the period, every child, every creature, every person is uh, by nature good. The creature originally is vegetarian, he lives on berries, uh, and uh, he is very uh, unselfish, very altruistic, and uh, uh, for example, he looks after the De Lacy family, he collects wood for them, uh, he looks after them, he protects them, uh, he doesn't want to harm any animal, he doesn't want to harm any creature. When he finds food and drinks, he finds, for example, at a certain time, he finds cheese, bread and a flask of wine. Uh, it takes the food, but it doesn't drink, or better, it takes a sip at the drink, but then he refuses it. So, uh, he's a very ethical creature at the beginning, but then he is perverted because society and all the people that get in touch with him judge him by his appearance and therefore mistreat him, insult him, misinterpret his good deeds and actions. And therefore, Mary Shelley notices the fact that sometimes uh, it is society that creates monsters and science that creates monsters because it is not connected with ethics, with the ethical aspects. So uh, in Frankenstein, this aspect is very, very much highlighted. And uh, um, therefore, we can talk about science fiction in Mary Shelley, but we cannot talk about gothic in Mary Shelley, because gothic, gothic novels, for example, um, are very clear cut. I mean, in the gothic novel, the bad character is bad and the good character is good. In science fiction, which is the genre that Mary Shelley gives birth to, everything is blurred. We really don't know what is good, what is bad, or to what extent what we believe 
is good may turn into a bad thing. For example, if uh, Victor Frankenstein had thought, okay, I am performing this experiment for uh, mankind so that I will be able to heal uh, people who are ill, I will be able to give back to, to give life back to people who have died prematurely. If he had been unselfish in his way of using science, then his experiment would have been good for mankind. Whereas Mary Shelley really uh, takes pain at highlighting the fact that Victor Frankenstein was acting out of sheer selfishness. He wanted to prove that he was the donor of life, that he could perform the part of God. So Mary Shelley doesn't blame science because science, if connected with ethics, is good. She blames scientists when for their own pride, for their own um, longing for supremacy over the other human beings, uh, turn themselves into monsters and therefore they turn their creation into a monstrous creation. Now, in the last part of my talk, because I think I only have something like 10 minutes and then there is additional uh, time for questions, I would like to move from Frankenstein to another novel that Mary Shelley wrote, which is very much connected with the problems that we are facing nowadays, the problem of the pandemic. Because Mary Shelley didn't simply uh, delve into the scientific side in Frankenstein. She also developed all the questions of ethics and science into another novel, which she wrote while she was in Italy, and she eventually published in 1826. So uh, something like eight years after the first publication of Frankenstein. I am talking about a novel that is entitled The Last Men. The Last Men is actually the science fiction novel by Mary Shelley, because it is actually set in the future, also for us, because the novel is set in 2073. And uh, it is uh, a novel within a novel. I mean, there is a frame narrative, uh, which is set in the present, uh, the present times of the writer. So uh, in 1820, 26. And this frame narrative, uh, somehow um, is a prophecy, I mean, encapsulates a prophecy for the future, which is the very body of the text. And in this very body of the text, uh, we have uh, England, Europe, and the world, which have become uh, high in colonialism. Neocolonialism is our modern problem. Neoliberal politics is our problem. So neocolonialism, uh, disrespect for nature, because uh, in, in The Last Man we see a lot of factories. Uh, she delves into the problem of pollution, um, uh, of the fact that uh, uh, some, some species are dying out because of pollution, because of the way we have perverted the planet. So the problems that she describes uh, set in the future are the problems that we are experiencing. And out of this huge uh, group of interconnected problems comes a pandemic. 
and this pandemic, which she simply calls the plague, but we may call COVID-19, this pandemic spreads from the East, and you know, we know that the pandemics actually spread from the East, from China, and uh, it conquers slowly, slowly the whole of the world. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, everybody but one person, that is the last man who is actually writing this prophecy, everybody dies. But what Mary Shelley highlights in this novel, uh, which is extremely interesting for us nowadays, is that once the pandemic spreads and all the factories stop, the air soon becomes cleaner uh, and the animals thrive and they take back what we human beings had deprived them from. So uh, she describes exactly what we are experiencing in this period. But the important thing is that The Last Man is actually a cautionary tale. It is some kind of warning signal. And she wrote this warning signal in 1826 by using science fiction to spell out the problems that we are now experiencing nowadays. She spoke about pollution, she spoke about manipulation of nature, she spoke about the problems that we are facing now because we don't take into consideration the fact that we are all interconnected and whatever we do to nature will have a backlash that will hit us very badly. But uh, uh, Mary Shelley wrote, I mean, this, this uh, tale into the tale to speak to her readers. And she used science fiction to send out important ethical messages that are very, very important nowadays. And I would like to conclude my talk by highlighting also the responsibility that we as teachers, as educators have in selecting texts for our curricula that may be used to ponder on our situation because literature can be used as a very powerful potent tool to improve society by using the reflections of those that before us grappled with the very problems that we are facing nowadays then we can uh, give ourselves a better chance to face the future and to choose the world we want to live in. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, ma'am. Wonderful message at the end. Really profound wisdom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Whatever question you might have, uh, curiosities, uh, something that you want me to uh, go deeper into, you just have to ask. Thank you so much for such a scintillating discussion, ma'am. I request all the participants to either raise their hands or maybe post their queries in the chat messages if they have any. Uh, okay, so Miss Anisha Patnaik has raised her hand. So uh, please unmute yourself and you can ask your query. Good evening, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Yes. Good afternoon, Professor Marino. Uh, thank you for that insightful lecture. Now, I want to say that I have been quite intrigued by Mary Wollstonecraft, who is Mary Shelley's mother. And we also know that she died tragically a few days after Mary Jr. was born. 
My yes. question to you, ma'am, is that do we see traces of Wollstonecraft in Mary Shelley's work, specifically her science fiction? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and thank you very much for the question. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, add a little piece of information connected with the death of Mary and the birth of Mary. So you see that uh, death and life are always connected from the very start of Mary Shelley's life are always connected. And this is another reason that prompted her to explore the liminal passage between life and death in her output. And uh, you also uh, should be aware of the fact that Mary Wollstonecraft died because of a scientific problem. I mean, in those days, people were not aware of sepsis, of the fact that bacteria uh, were all over our hands and our body. And therefore, whoever performed dissections, uh, so in the, the, they used to manipulate the corpses with the same hands without even washing them, uh, performed the uh, delivery of babies. And this is probably the reason that that uh, um, created uh, a problem for Mary Wollstonecraft because uh, the doctor that actually uh, um, helped her to deliver uh, was a doctor that also used to perform um, uh, surgical operation and anatomical uh, and dissection practices. Probably there was a bacteria contamination in Mary Wollstonecraft that created the problem uh, and uh, eventually uh, led to her death. But going back to what you asked me, uh, for sure, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft was a very powerful uh, source of inspiration for Mary Shelley in relation also to the role of women in society. Um, and in the novel, you see, in Frankenstein, you see that there are very, very few women. And the women who are there, uh, such as Elizabeth Lavenza, Justine, or Victor's mother, actually either die immediately or they speak very little or they have a very minor role. They cannot have any effect on any other people. Uh, when they speak, they are not effective. And uh, this is a way that Mary Shelley uh, used to uh, report, to denounce, to um, underline the fact that in society, women were absolutely powerless. And the very fact that Victor Frankenstein did not push himself to create a female figure is also remarkable. He did that apparently because he didn't want to give birth to, um, you know, a progeny, a hideous progeny uh, by allowing the creature and the female creature to produce children. But, but you could also think that the very reason why he did not do it is because he considered women even less. So Mary Wollstonecraft was absolutely present in Mary Shelley's mind while she was writing Frankenstein, as well as any other work that she wrote. Now, I read in the chat box um, Harshit Sharma, who is asking me to highlight something related to the former title of the novel, which is actually the subtitle of the novel, The Modern Prometheus. Uh, this is also controversial because Prometheus is a positive figure for mankind because uh, he stole the fire from the gods and he stole all the arts from the god and uh, he gave them to men. But in this case, science is not really helping mankind because it is disconnected from ethics. 
because this science comes out of selfishness, out of pride, out of self-centeredness, not out of empathy and solidarity, uh, like in the case of uh, uh, the Greek Prometheus. So the modern Prometheus is a perverted version of the Greek Prometheus. And thank you for the question. Uh, okay, uh, yes, uh, uh, I think Devanshi's question is very much similar to Anisha. Uh, okay. All right, so there is another participant who wants to ask the question, ma'am, Ms. Seema Somani. Please unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Uh, good afternoon, Professor. Uh, am I audible to you all? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Good afternoon, Professor Marino. Uh, it was a wonderful experience to hear you, uh, your discourse based upon science fiction. And I'm also a professor dealing with the science fiction because the latest uh, Punjab University has introduced in curricula the science fiction. And being a teacher, I'm very glad, uh, I'm feeling very excited that we are dealing with some contemporary uh, features of the, you know, present day generation. Uh, like uh, there is Aldo Huxley's novel, Brave New World. And there are some ideas of test tube baby, surrogacy, Henry Ford's mass uh, com consumption and production. But my question to you is this, Professor Marino, uh, as a teacher, when we teach the students, they feel very delighted, excited, thrilled. But actually, these science fiction, most of them are open-ended novels. By the end, uh, when we teach the students, by the end of the novel, there is certain some lack of some uh, cathartic effect or aesthetic pleasure. And it seems that we are propagating over materialism based upon rationality and deprived of ethical problems, ethical issues. So somehow as a teacher, I feel myself in a fix how to teach them uh, some, you know, ethical issues or some themes based upon ethicality and, you know, godliness. We, mm -hmm. These elements are really lacking in science fiction. So sometimes we feel that they are not as you know, uh, they are not feeling as aesthetically pleased as they feel while reading Dante, Milton, so many other writers. So uh, Virginia Woolf and there are so many other writers that they feel so elated. So how to deal with the, the students while reading the science fiction, how to end up with some of the fiction? Okay, thank you very much for the question. And uh, uh, while I answer, I will try also to answer some of the questions in the chat box, uh, because they asked me uh, to explore a little bit more um, the reasons why um, Frankenstein is not a Gothic novel, but it is a science fiction novel. So I will try to give uh, an answer that will connect uh, all the elements. Now, um, with my students, uh, what I always try to do is to encourage them to change perspective, which is an ability that they have to develop also in their real life uh, if they want to communicate effectively with other people, if they want not to be a prejudiced when they deal with other people. So I always ask them to look at the novel by the perspective of all the different characters. And, uh, uh, you know, by the end uh, of, uh, of the course, they all empathize very much with the creature because they realize that the whole of the situation, all of the problems would have been avoided if, if the scientist had taken responsibility for his own creation instead of abandoning his creation uh, and uh, live in his creation on its own in the world without any knowledge of the world. So, um, you know, by asking the students to um, put themselves in the shoes 
of the characters. I think they themselves will bring out all the ethical elements of the novel instead of uh, uh, limiting themselves uh, or floating on the surface of phenomena. And this leads me to uh, the, the, the second question. Why is it not a Gothic novel? Because in the Gothic novel, we have mystery, we have horror, we have ghosts, we have the supernatural. Here in Frankenstein, nothing is actually supernatural. Everything is man created. Mm -hmm. The creature itself was produced in a laboratory. So it is not something, I mean, um, fairy or monstrous that comes from above. The responsibility is always in the hands of men. And this is the most important teaching of Mary Shelley, who is entertaining like a Gothic novel, but she takes back the responsibility to give back the responsibility to men. So she forces us to think of the outcome of our actions. Whatever we do, as we are interconnected with other people, as an impact, not just on our life or on the life of the people that immediately surround us, but on the world. And this is probably the most important ethical teaching of Mary Shelley in Frankenstein. And thank you for so much for all these questions. I'm reading, I'm reading the, uh, anybody the, else can, uh, who has a question can also raise the hand if there's anybody who would like to ask a question. Okay, uh, Harshit is asking now, I wonder, does it mean Walton in the novel becomes the ideal character by Mary Shelley? Um, okay, he's not really the ideal character, but, but Walton and Victor Frankenstein are very similar. Walton acknowledges and recognizes very much of himself in Victor. Okay, but the important thing is that uh, Victor warns Walton by telling him his story. Victor is telling Walton, please don't be led by your ambition only. Don't drive your crew in a place where uh, probably they will die. Okay, so also Frankenstein can be considered as a cautionary tale because Victor Frankenstein actually uh, sends a warning signal to Walton. And then in the end, Walton decides to go back instead of pursuing his ambition. So in a way, Walton can be considered ideal in the sense that he recognizes his mistake. He acknowledges the fact that he and Victor were led by ambition, not by ethical values. And therefore, he is wise enough as to go back. So thank you very much for this question. Thank you, Professor Palanza. Now, uh, there is also Kajal, I think, as we can see in the novel Frankenstein, that meddling with nature is not a part of the natural order of thing and will end in tragedy. So according to you, how much freedom should be given to the scientists to meddle with nature? Um, okay, right. Uh, that's my personal opinion. Um, a scientist should always take into consideration the impact of his actions. I mean, uh, he or she should never pursue a research just for the sake of his ambition, his result, or his glory. 
okay? Everything should be done for the welfare of a larger community. And if there is the possibility that whatever I research on, whatever I do, may have a negative impact on mankind, then a scientist should refrain from doing it. This is my personal opinion. Uh, let me see. Uh... Uh, there is another participant, ma'am, Miss Ishika Garg, who has raised her hand. So you can unmute yourself. Yes, please. Uh, okay, so she has disconnected from the meeting. There's another question about, you know, why do you think that it is such a controversial novel? Uh, Where is it? I think it has been asked by uh, Priyanka. So she says, thank you so much, ma'am. Your lecture was so informative. I'm honored to hear you. Can you please explain how it is a controversial novel? How it is a... Uh, I can't... Uh, it says how it is a controversial novel. A controversial novel. Uh, it is a controversial novel because on the one hand, um, you know, we are... Uh, driven to improve, uh, we want to defeat death, uh, we want to uh, become immortal and uh, the theme of immortality is very much present in uh, uh, Mary Shelley's output. She also wrote other short stories uh, connected with the theme of immortality, The Mortal Immortal, for example. Uh, but uh, um, even our idea of immortality, uh, in a way, if we were immortal, we would not appreciate life as much as we do. Because uh, we human beings tend not to appreciate what we have. We take it for granted. Okay, so Mary Shelley wanted to send this kind of message don't take your life for granted don't take what you have for granted because you may lose it everything is precious in life your very life is precious your very moment this moment is precious every day is precious so um you know this is also a very controversial message, challenging message that she sends to her readership. Uh, then uh, the very father of Mary Shelley, William Godwin, believed that if we used rationality only, we could defeat diseases and even death. Well, Mary Shelley strongly disagreed with him because if you use only rationality and if you don't take into consideration the emotional, the humane side that we also have, then you create monsters. And this is exactly what Victor Frankenstein did. He used only the rational side. He neglected the emotional, the sympathetic side. And he simply discarded his creature because uh, he was not as beautiful and uh, as perfect as he thought he would be. So uh, this is also another very controversial element of the novel and thank you for the question. Oh, there is also another, mm, okay, my question is what challenges did Mary Shelley face? So, Ha. Mary Shelley faced many challenges when she wrote this novel and also when she published the novel. Um, she was a woman. First of all, women were not supposed to publish because publishing was regarded as a form of prostitution. And she was not supposed to meddle with scientific matters, which were uh, uh, the domain of men. So these were the most important challenges she had to face as you know, many others. Probably you are aware of the fact that when Frankenstein was published, and it was published anonymously, it was a bestseller. And as soon as she claimed authorship of the novel, the sales of the novel went down dramatically because people got disgusted 
by the fact that a woman, a life giver, because uh, according to uh, biology, women are just life givers, was writing about life, death, immortality, meddling with nature. She was not supposed to do it as a woman and as a writer. And therefore, she had to face very, very many challenges for this novel. So thank you very much for the question. This one, Dana Sharma, to please mute herself. Uh, okay, thank you so much for uh, addressing all the questions, ma'am. It was such a pleasure to hear another of your such mind-boggling talks. I just, just one, just one minute, Ovi. Uh, uh, Dr. Marino, what is your take on transhumanism and posthumanism in the light of what we have discussed today? <laughs> I think that all the critical debates that we are uh, grappling with at the moment uh, are very important uh, because they take us back to something that we keep neglecting. The fact that we are humane, the fact that we are interconnected, the fact that we have to take responsibility for what we do. We think that science is somehow um, disconnected because it's above, okay? But it is not. Scientists, uh, scientists should be ethical, first of all. Uh, think of the COVID, think of the pandemic. There are also conspiracy theories according to which the virus was lab created. This is possible this is possible there are a lot of viruses that are created nowadays and may be used as weapons of mass destruction but we have to think differently and all the debates on posthumanism uh, take us back to the fact that we have to think differently we cannot think of ourselves as separated from what we may even deem the enemy we are connected with the enemy we are all a human family and therefore whatever we do has an impact on everybody's life even our own life so that's the most important thing thank you thank you oh uh, um Simran is asking me about uh, my own interpretation uh, about the end of the novel. And that's a very important point. Well, you are probably aware of the fact uh, that uh, um, Frankenstein was heavily edited by Percy Shelley. Uh, in actual fact, uh, when Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, she never used the harsh words against the creature. She never called him monster, she never called him fiend. It was Percy Shelley who actually inserted those words uh, to um, make the creature a monster, okay? When Mary Shelley wrote her novel, uh, originally she had thought of a very open ending with the creature who simply got dispersed. So she never killed the creature in her intention. She possibly thought in her mind that the creature could survive in uh, maybe in the North Pole or in South America, in the places where he himself uh, uh, wanted to go and he expressed his intention to Victor Frankenstein. Removed from mankind, but alive and uh, uh, even capable of looking after uh, the nature of those places. Because as I mentioned before, the creature is a vegetarian and uh, uh, he highlights this fact very much. Percy Shelley changed the final part because we know that uh, the creature wants to kill himself by throwing himself on a funeral pyre and therefore go back to the element of fire uh, that is reminiscent of Prometheus. But uh, we should distinguish these two endings. Uh, Percy Shelley's idea of the end of the creature and Mary Shelley's 
possibility given to the creature to thrive, prosper, and uh, uh, go back to being a good-natured uh, being. So thank you so much. I want to leave you my email address, so it's in the chat box. So if you have any other question or any other comment, uh, please uh, just drop me an email and I will be delighted to answer. There is another question by uh, Ru Chika. Uh, Madam, it's easy to say science fiction is more inclusive than it used to be or authors are more diverse. But how is that actually affecting change and what does it mean for the next decade of science fiction? Science fiction has always been used as a way of pondering on the current times. So um, even dystopias, dystopias are exaggerations of what is actually happening. So we should look at science fiction, we should read more science fiction, and we should consider it as an exaggerated way uh, or as a magnifying way of looking at our problems. So we should read science fiction as a magnifying lens that gives us the opportunity to look in details at something that is affecting our society and that we may not be able to see uh, if we looked at it uh, uh, with bare eyes. I don't know if there is any other comment, any other message, any other question. Okay. So thank you to all the participants as well for asking such wonderful questions and giving such a diversified line of thought to all of us to ponder over once the discussion is over. I now hand over uh, the uh, I'll call Dr. Arti Kapoor to uh, extend her uh, words for the event. Thank you. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, you are. Okay. Thank you. Warm greetings to one and all present here on this virtual platform. Distinguished resource person of the day, Dr. Elisabetta Marino, Associate Professor of English Literature at University of Rome and Academician par excellence. Esteemed Dr. Nisha Bhargava, Principal MCM DAV College for Women, Chandigarh. Worthy Dr. Rekha Sudhanda, Principal Gopichand Arya Mahila College, Abohar, respected Nina Sharma, ma'am, head PG Department of English, ma'am Ur Urvi Sharma ji, the rest of the members of the organizing committee, dear faculty members and dearest students, I, Dr. Arthi Kapoor, on behalf of MCM DAV College and GCAM College Fraternity, extend a hearty vote of thanks and acknowledge my sincere appreciation to our worthy resource person, Dr. Elisabetta Marino, for imparting intellectual talk on the topic, Mary Shelley, <clears throat> the birth of and birth of science fiction. Ma'am, your scholarly and insightful discourse has definitely added new dimensions to understand science fiction with special reference to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to worthy ma'am principal Dr. Nisha Bhargavaji for providing us this opportunity. I would also like to express my gratitude to worthy ma'am principal Dr. Rekha Sudhanda for her continuous guidance. I extend my heartfelt thanks to respected Nina Sharma ma'am, head department of English and dear Urvi Sharma ma'am and other members of the organizing committee for their support and cooperation. Special thanks to all the students as I always count them as one of my life's biggest blessings. Thanks for your zeal and enthusiasm. Dear all, it was indeed an enriching, enlightening, and gripping lecture. In a very comprehensive manner, 
Dr. Marino has illustrated the concept of galvanism, evolution and creation, humanistic as well as scientific researches, and how elements of science have been used to ponder over the ethical problems and it is the society that actually creates monsters. So many ideas have been discussed in a capsule form in such a short period and particularly the concluding point of the lecture was thought provoking and it's quite relevant nowadays. All of us are glad to be a part of this learning platform. My heartfelt thanks to everyone who contributed to make it a success. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor. May I now request everyone to kindly switch on the video so that we can have a group picture for the records. All our participants. <clears throat> Ritika has taken the picture. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thanks for being part of this academic extravaganza. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Marina. No. Thank you, Sudhmas. Thank, Thank, no. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was my absolute pleasure. Anytime. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.